What up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show, Live and Learn, another web series I'm going to launch here, where uh, periodically we'll just uh, dive into some shit randomly. And today's topic is going to be Bluetooth, uh, because we always use it, and not that many people understand how it works. So I personally was curious and decided to investigate. Let's see how this shit goes. Um, I've already uh, taken like 10 to 15 minutes to do a little Googling. And um, it looks like Bluetooth is not that much different than radio. It uh, operates at a much higher frequency, um, meaning that the wavelength of it is far shorter than radio. Um, but it operates in a very similar zone to that of Wi-Fi as well. So you'll see here that it operates at frequencies between 2402 and 2480 hertz, megahertz. Um, or 2400 and 2483.5 megahertz, including guard bands 2 mega millihertz wide at the bottom end and 3.5 at the top. Okay, interesting. So <clears throat> this is in the globally unlicensed but not unregulated industrial, scientific, and medical range, short frequency, short range radio frequency band. Very interesting. So physical range is usually to test less than 10 meters. I'm not sure if that's due to the extremely short wavelength and high frequency, or if that's just going to be the strength of the, of the transmitter itself, or perhaps the uh, sensitivity of the receivers. However, um, this is definitely a short range technology, just like Wi-Fi, and I'd be interested in learning what the limitations are uh, that affect that. Um, just to take a look quick at the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, you'll see here that visible light falls around here, 10, around 10 to the negative 7, 10 to the negative 6 um, meters in wavelength. So we're talking about like fractions of a millimeter. And uh, you can see here that the more, um, the more increase you see in the frequency, the closer you get to red. And the more you decrease, you see closer to violet. And once you get past the visible spectrum going lower, uh, you end up with your UV rays, which we know, of course, are cancerous and dangerous, uh, onto your X rays, which, of course, we use to probe our body and see if there's any skeletal damage most of the time. And then gamma rays, um, which I'm not even certain uh, of any use for those, but uh, I'm pretty sure they come out of the sun. <clears throat> Let's double check. A gamma ray is a penetrating electromagnetic radiation arising from the radioactive decay of atomic nuclei. Okay, looks like I was wrong, perhaps. It consists of the shortest wavelength electromagnetic waves and so imparts the highest photon energy. Let me see. Yeah, the sun is spitting out. Yes, yeah, so there it is. The sun is spitting out. <laughs> Strange patterns of gamma rays. Okay, so I was right about that. Um, I think I'd heard that before somewhere. And now if we go into the larger wavelengths, um, we get into infrared when we go past red, which is probably why they call it infrared. And what is infrared used for? Let's see. The sensing and detection. All objects on Earth emit IR radiation in the form of heat. Oh, wow. Very interesting. Okay, so infrared radiation is on a similar wavelength as heat. That would be a very interesting rabbit hole to continue down. Um, what else can you use it for? Oh, holy shit. Infrared light is even used to heat food sometimes. Special lamps that emit thermal infrared rays are often used in fast food restaurants. Shorter near infrared rays are not hot at all. In fact, you cannot even feel them. These shorter wavelengths are the ones used by your TV's remote control. Holy shit, that's very interesting. Okay. Now, once we get past the infrared at around 10 to the negative 3 meters, um, we're talking about radio waves. And I'm not certain about this, but I'm pretty sure that AM is closer to infrared, and then FM is further away. And then once we get up to that um, 
2400 area, which is like around here, it looks like. Um, we're talking Wi Fi and we're talking um, Bluetooth. So, this is very interesting to me um, that the infrared can be used to heat things up. Where are microwaves on this spectrum, I wonder? So, microwaves are. Okay, wow. So, microwaves are <laughs> in this fucking area, bro. Whoa. Holy shit. So, by being exposed to them, potentially, we could be slowly cooking. That's intense. Where the hell is 5G go? And cellular signal. What, yeah, what's the cellular signal? Difference between cell phone signal and Bluetooth. No, 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 no. Alright, how about what frequency is 5G? Yeah, that's what we wanted to know. Using the same for his weaponized crowd control. Whoa. I, whoa, I, I just said what frequency is 5G. This is getting very uh, dark. <laughs> that was my best Kawhi Leonard impression. Um, say cellular and Wi Fi networks rely on microwaves, type of electronic like reason. Utilize frequencies up to 6 gigahertz in order to wireless transmit voice and data. This era of wireless frequency is almost over making room for the new 5G applications, which will require using new spectrum bands in a much higher frequency range and beyond, utilizing sub-millimeter sub and millimeter waves. Millimeter waves are utilized by U.S. Army and crowd dispersal guns called active denial systems. Dr. Paul Ben Nisai pointed to research that was commissioned by the U.S. Army to find out why people ran away when being touched to them. If you're unlucky enough to be standing there when it hits you, you will feel like your body's on fire. The U.S. Department of Defense explains how. The sensation dissipates when the target moves out of the beam. The sensation is intense enough to cause a nearly instantaneous reflex action of the target to flee the beam. It uses radio frequency millimeter waves in the 96 gigahertz range to penetrate the top 164th of an inch of layer of skin on the target individual, instantly producing an intolerable heating sensation that causes them to flee. A lot of respected people have posted warnings about the mass deployment of commercial millimeter wave technology. Yo, this is this is not even where I was trying to go. I mean, this is definitely the type of shit that I'll read about and then tell people about, and they'll be like, all right, yeah, whatever, dude. Let me finish my beer. However, um, I have seen a lot of videos of people approaching their local governments with concerns regarding 5G. Now, I don't understand why 4G and 5G would be so much different. I also don't understand the significance of switching to 5G unless a higher frequency would result in more bandwidth being able to be carried over that. That's possible. I'm also curious as how you know the fluctuation of the wave um, conveys information to um, any device. Like, what would be... Hmm. Like what would be a good method for that? It's not ones and twos. Is it? Is it maybe like when maybe it is ones and zeros rather than not ones and twos? Maybe it is that when you're at the peak of a crest, it's considered like a zero or a one, and then vice versa when you're at the the swell. But then that would mean you'd be getting mixed results based on your distance from the transmitter, based on the signal's distance from the transmitter. So that's fucking crazy to think about. Um, let's read what this one had to say. Electromagnetic spectrum. The entire distribution of the electromagnetic spectrum according to frequency or wavelength. Although all electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light in a vacuum, they do so at a wide range of frequencies, wavelengths, and photon energies. The electromagnetic spectrum comprises the span of all electromagnetic radiation and consists of many subranges, commonly referred to as portions, such as visible light or ultraviolet radi radiation. The various portions bear different names based on differences in behavior in the emission, transmission, and absorption of the corresponding waves, and also based on their different practical applications. There are no precise accepted boundaries between any of these contiguous portions, so the ranges tend to overlap. Whoa, that's fucking intense. 
That's fucking intense. And then sound waves are also on this spectrum as well, right? So what frequency are sound waves? Wow, 20 hertz compared to compared to 600 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. Wow. Okay, what's the frequency of 4G? Oh wow, significantly lower. Well, let's see, 700, what does it say? 700 megahertz. Nineteen hundred megahertz compared to six gigahertz. Dude, there must be something about the increase in frequency and the max amount of bandwidth. At least that's my suspicion. Somebody please set me straight if that's not the case. <clears throat> Things you should know about Bluetooth range. Like all communication technologies, Bluetooth is a better fit for some applications than others. If you're considering using Bluetooth, here's an outline of the primary factors that determine the effective range of Bluetooth communications, plus some ways to improve it with networking. This article is now updated with the addition of Bluetooth 5 performance. Bluetooth Classic versus Bluetooth Low Energy. Bluetooth was originally designed to exchange a lot of data at close range and continuous streaming data applications. The devices are able to both send and receive data at the same time. This is perfect for many common consumer products such as computer headsets where the two devices are close together. When Bluetooth Low Energy, formerly called Bluetooth Smart, hit the market in 2011, the key advantage over earlier versions was low power consumption over the same range, but with lower bandwidth. It's intended for devices that only need to exchange small amounts of data periodically, extending battery life by months or even years. So all their ranges are the same, and all their speeds are the same in a vacuum, which we also learned. Their max range in a free field. What is class two outdoors? The fuck? What the fuck? I have no idea what the fuck that meant. All right, well. Oh well. They all rock the same frequency. Interesting. And this one's got a topped out bandwidth. So basically previous versions of Bluetooth had a higher bandwidth. And I suspect that they were using shorter wavelengths, which means higher frequency. Application throughput. What the hell is application throughput? Often we see the workload to a web application measured by throughput. It's a way of quantifying the volume of requests and responses in relation to time. Transactions per second, or TPS, is the most common ratio used. A performance test plan usually contains certain throughput goals. Wow, so it's how often is it gonna be figuring out what's going on at the, at the transmitter. So zero, 0.7 to 2.1 megabits per second, and then this only gets up to kilobits per second. Holy shit. Interesting. So I, I may have been wrong. Maybe these one, these Bluetooth version 2.1s were on the higher end of, of the spectrum. And by higher end, I mean a higher frequency. Um, and short, that which means shorter bandwidth. Yeah, shorter wavelength, sorry. And then these probably got simmered down a little bit. And it looks like this one was porridge too hot. This one was porridge too cold. And now Bluetooth 5 low energy should be just right. Okay, interesting. Now your range depends on surroundings, radio performance, and antennas. There are many factors affecting Bluetooth range, typically. The output power of the transmitter, the sensitivity of the receiver, physical obstacles in the transmission path, the antennas. While the radio performance and antennas are pretty static for a given Bluetooth device, the surroundings can vary a lot. Outdoors in an open field, you can get a range of up to 100 meters. But that is a rare situation. Whoa, outdoors in an open field. Indoors, obstacles like concrete walls will attenuate 
the radio signal, and the effective range will be drastically reduced. In normal use, 10 meters is a good guide to what can be achieved between two Bluetooth devices indoors. When developing a Bluetooth device, you can give your device a better range by selecting the Bluetooth chip with the best receiver sensitivity and output power, and making sure that you use a good antenna. Sometimes you may need to use Bluetooth over hundreds of thousands of meters. In the next section, we'll discuss how to extend Bluetooth range using networks. Okay, here we go. Typical use of Bluetooth and Bluetooth low energy. Wireless headsets, file transfer between devices, wireless printers and wireless speakers. Okay, so these are fucking high transaction per second applications. And now Bluetooth low energy, medical devices for monitoring reporting, sports and fitness devices, industrial monitoring sensors, home automation, geo-based targeting, targeted promotions via beacons, public transportation apps, remote controls, PC peripherals. Hmm. I mean, this Bluetooth low energy feels like it'd be much safer than, than this one over here. Bluetooth 5 enhancements. Version 5 of the Bluetooth specification brought with it a number of improvements, all aimed at making the low energy part of the Bluetooth more flexible. 2 megabit high speed mode allowing you to increase the data rate or reduce the average current consumption at the cost of a small range reduction. Wow, so, okay, wow, this is very interesting. And then 125 kilobytes or 500 kilo BPS, kilobytes per second, long range mode allowing you to increase range at the cost of reducing data rate and increased average current consumption. Wow, okay. Advertising extension feature, allowing up to eight times the data throughput in broadcasting applications like beacons. Maximum output power increased from plus 10 decibytes per meter. What does DBM stand for? DBM, sometimes DBMW or decibel milliwatts is a unit of level used to indicate that a power ratio is expressed in decibels with reference to one milliwatt. What? What the fuck? Is this the same decibel? Wait, what? Is this the same decibels as sound decibels? It must be. Whoa. Man, maybe I shouldn't have looked into this. This is going to be making me crazy. Maximum output increased from 10 decibel millimeters. Is that what that was? Decibel milliwatts to plus 20 decibel milliwatts, allowing more powerful power amplifiers to be used, boosting range forward. Further, new channel selection policy added, making it possible for more devices to coexist in the same environment without interfering with each other. Selection policy. How to improve Bluetooth range with networking. You can connect Bluetooth devices to multiple distributed gateways connected to the internet. The Bluetooth devices can communicate with each other and with online services via these gateways. This is an ideal solution if the devices are spread over a large geographical area. Each hub can usually only handle a few directly connected devices, which is another limitation of Bluetooth. You're likely to run into a situation where you want to handle hundreds or even thousands of Bluetooth devices in a relatively small area, such as an office building. For this, you need to use a mesh network to connect the gateway and local Bluetooth devices. The power of mesh networks. The number of devices that require low power operation and communication with each other Blah, 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 blah. Online services are growing daily. In order to support this, BLE introduced support for mesh networks. Okay, large number of Bluetooth devices. Fucking John Gunner. Wow. Okay. So this is pretty creepy. What frequency is microwaves?
300 megahertz to Dude, so microwaves are around 300 megahertz and 300 gigahertz. Giga or kilo? Ten to the ninth. What's mega? Mega is ten to the sixth. So microwaves are a much lower frequency than what we're talking about. It's fucking wild that this is like logarithmic. Kilo hecto giga. So kilos are the baby guys. Interesting. So kilos. 10 to the 3rd, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 9th. So 10 to the 3rd, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 9th. Wow, I wonder what, what there's left to discover, or if this is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. It's just crazy. Hmm. So in a nutshell, this shit is basically just like radio, but it's extremely short range. However, the higher frequency, which results in shorter wavelength, results in a higher speed of communication, as well as, and by speed, I mean how actively the receiver listens or the transmitter broadcasts and then that super short wavelength aka high frequency results in a higher maximum bandwidth transmission potentially is that how that works let's get the uh, let's get that other article that we had up and then maybe we can see I should not close that Okay, let's see this. It doesn't tell you, but they're all in the gigahertz range. Very interesting. So there's only 79 different, dude, that's so, that sounds so easy to hack. There's only 79 different frequencies. Huh. I wonder what the handshake protocol is. How's the pairing process work? It says understanding and it's not mentioned anywhere else in the article. I guess we'll just see. It has a unique 48 bit address. Okay. Every single Bluetooth device has a unique 48 bit address, commonly abbreviated BDAR. This will usually be presented in the form of a 12 digit hexadecimal value. Most significant half, 24 bits of the address is in an organization unique identifier, OUI, which identifies the manufacturer. The lower 24 bits are the more unique part of the address. This address should be visible on most Bluetooth devices. Creating a Bluetooth connection between two devices is a multi-step process involving three progressive states. One, inquiry. If two Bluetooth devices know absolutely nothing about each other, one must run an inquiry to try to discover the other. One device sends out the inquiry request, and any device listening for such a request will respond with its address and possibly its name and other information. <laughs> That's sketchy. Two, paging, connecting. 
Paging is the process of forming a connection between two Bluetooth devices. Before this connection can be initiated, each device needs to know the address of the other, found in the inquiry process. Connection. After a device has completed the paging process, it enters the connection state. While connected, a device can either be actively participating or it can be put into a low power sleep mode. Active mode. This is the regular connected mode, where the device is actively transmitting or receiving data. Sniff mode. This is a power saving mode where the device is less active. It'll sleep and only listen for transmissions at a set interval. For example, every 100 milliseconds. Hold mode. Hold mode is a temporary power saving mode where a device sleeps for a defined period of time, then returns back to active mode when that interval has passed. The master can command a slave device to hold. Park mode. Park is the deepest of sleep modes. A master can command a slave to park, and that slave will become inactive until the master tells it to wake back up. Okay, that's interesting, but it doesn't tell me shit. I mean, guess it says that it passes on the address, but how? Like, how does a device interpret? Bluetooth signal. And is it like technically possible to be using radio waves to produce the same connective It, yeah, is it possible for you to use radio waves to do handshaking and pairing? I mean, it might be, actually, because I know around standard radio, there's head units that'll put, like, the name of the song that's playing and shit. I wonder if that's a perpetual signal, or if that's, like, at the beginning of the song, they send a signal, and then it only needs to be sent one and done, and then... The receiving device can just keep it up there. This shit is so crazy. It's happening all the time everywhere. Huh. Well, shit. I want to see... I want to see, like, where microwaves are. And then compare that to Bluetooth. So let's see the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's see if we can get a good picture. Okay, so microwaves are at like 10 to the negative 2, and then radio waves go higher. Alright. And then I know for a fact that microwaves are very dangerous to be in. Ha! <laughs> we fucking cook, right? So is infrared dangerous? I'm gonna move this a little closer for you guys to see. Like, is infrared dangerous? I wonder. Because we know UV is. And we know x-rays are, and I'm pretty sure all the rest of these are also. Now, oh wow, unbelievable, I haven't seen this before. So electricity is about 10 to the 7th. This is very interesting. I love this image because it shows the inverse relationship between the frequency of the signal and the length of the wave that corresponds with it. Cool, electricity's up here. So long radio waves are up here, but, wow, so long radio waves are up here. AM and FM is right here, 10 to the 6, 10 to 8. And then everything up here we're using so these are long waves at actually a relatively slow frequency. So perhaps my bandwidth, my bandwidth thought was wrong. This is also fucking cool, dude. Very interesting. Hmm. Well, I definitely learned a thing or two here today. I don't know if uh, I'm going to get a much better understanding, but at like a at a software level, and, you know, given my background, I'm extremely curious as to how uh, transmitters and receivers convey their address to one another. 
And uh, also that segmentation of the Bluetooth devices into different um, uninterferable ranges is another thing that I would just be extremely interested in learning. Well, shit. This has been the first episode of Live and Learn. I'm about to pump out a quick supplementary video on the number 42. We're getting our geek on this Friday. And uh, for those of you who tuned in, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, live on Twitch, as well as those who are seeing this after the fact on YouTube. This has been Young Stoner. Over and out.